Hi guys, welcome to Web Scraping and Mapping Dam Levels in Python. In this course, we are going to be covering a couple of topics ranging from web mapping, web scraping, data visualization, ETL, and databases. So let's take a deeper dive into each and every one of these topics that we are going to be covering in this course. So the first one is mapping. So as a mapping library, we are going to be using leaflet.js. So leaflet.js is a JavaScript library that's used for building interactive maps. The second topic that we will be covering is called web scraping. So web scraping is a form of data mining which involves extracting data from a website. The third topic that we will be looking at is data visualization. So data visualization is the process of visualizing data by displaying it in graphs. So the visualization library that we are going to use is chart.js. So chart.js is a JavaScript library used for building interactive graphs. The next topic that we will be covering is ETL. So ETL stands for Extract, Transform and Load. So ETL is the process of extracting data from a variety of sources, cleaning and transforming that data, and then loading that data into a target table or a flat file. The last topic that we will be covering is databases. So the database that we are going to be using is PostgreSQL with PostGIS extensions. So PostgreSQL is where our data will be stored at in the long term. Okay, so let's take a look at the application. So this is a WebGIS application. So what this does is it maps six main dams that we depend on in Cape Town as a source of our residential water. Okay, so these dams supply water to basically all the suburbs in this region. Okay, so firstly, I want you to notice the size of all the circle markers. So if I click on one, a pop-up window will show up displaying the name of the dam. So this dam is called the Berg River Dam. And this dam is called the Water Screw Dam. So as you can see, it's plotted in the form of a bubble plot and each point varies in size. However, it's indistinguishable if the dams are all filled to 100% capacity. So if the size of the point is smaller compared to the rest of the points, it means that the value of that point is less. And if the point seems to be larger than most of the other points, it means that the value of that point is larger. So each and every dam's value will be in the form of a percentage. So this will give us an idea of how full each dam is. So this data resides in the Western Cape government's website. So this data gets published on a weekly basis and sometimes it takes a little bit longer, but it's reasonably current. So we're not using historical data. This is live data. Okay, so if we take a look at the KPI here, it displays the average water stored in the entire region. So what it does is that it takes each percentage value of water available in the six dams and it works out the mean, meaning the average of water that we have available in the entire region. So right now we are in the green. We have this percentage of water available in the region, which is great. And you can see next to the value, we have a green arrow pointing upwards. So this is a KPI that indicates that we are not in danger of a drought. So we still have a reasonable amount of water in our dams overall, in this region specifically. So once we reach a value of below 50%, the arrow will point downwards and it will turn red. So this logic is built into this application as well. And another thing that we can do is add a notification for when the region is below 50%. This could be an email or SMS notification warning us that we are in danger of running out of water in our dams. Okay, so let's take a look at the data. So as you can see, each dam is color coded. So each color is unique for that specific dam. And if we look at our donut chart, we can see each slice has a different color, which corresponds to the color of the circle marker, which corresponds to the dam. So we can see the Berg River Dam is a dark blue color. And in the donut chart, we can see the Berg River Dam is also a dark blue color. And the value is the percentage of water that's left in the dam currently, which is this much. So we can see the percentage value as we are over over the slice that corresponds to the dam. So in this donut chart, we are visualizing the dam levels for this week. So this is the amount of water that we have stored currently this week. 
and below you will see that we have a multibar bar chart so multibar bar charts are used for comparison so we'll be comparing this week's value versus last week's value versus last year's value so let's compare this week and last year so as you can see we are looking pretty good compared to last year which is true because we have been receiving a fair amount of rainfall which then filled up our dams so as you can see this is real world data and this application can be used for live monitoring okay so that's it for this video i'll see you guys in the course thank you hi guys welcome back in this lesson we will be installing and configuring PostgreSQL and PostGIS so let's open our terminal okay and then let's switch over to the root user Okay, and now the first thing that we need to do is we need to add a repository for PostgreSQL. And then we add a key. And now we can update our environment after we have added the repository and key. So now we are ready to install PostgreSQL. So let's run the following command sudo apt-get install PostgreSQL 15. Okay, so once PostgreSQL has been installed, we can now install PostGIS by running the following command. sudo apt-get install PostGIS PostgreSQL 15 PostGIS 3. Okay, so now we have successfully installed PostgreSQL and PostGIS. So that's it for this lesson. I'll see you guys in the next one. Thank you. Hi guys, welcome back. In this lesson, we will be installing GDAL, which is a required library for developing GIS applications and handling geospatial data. So let's first update our system by running the following command. sudo apt-get update. Okay, and now let's install the GDAL libraries.
Okay, so once we have installed GDAL, we are now ready to create the geospatial database for our application. So that's it for this video. I'll see you guys in the next one. Thank you. Hi guys, welcome back. In this lesson, we will be creating our spatial database. This will store the tables and data that will be used by our application. So the first thing that we need to do is enter the command line interface of PostgreSQL in full admin mode. So this is the default user that's created for you when you install PostgreSQL. Okay, so now we are going to create our database by running the following command. Create DB CPT water. So the name of our database will be CPT water. So now the next thing that we need to do is create a new user for our application to access the database. So let's do that by running the following command. Create user dash s water watch dash p. Now we need to add the password. So the password that we will use for this user is just Postgres for simplicity sake. Okay, so now let's enter into our database from the PostgreSQL shell. So the first thing that we need to do is grant all privileges on our database to our user, which we have called WaterWatch. Okay, and the next thing that we need to do is add GIS extensions to convert our database into a geospatial database. So the first extension that we will add is PostGIS. And then the next extension that we will add is PostGIS topology. Okay, once we have done that, we can quit the PostgreSQL terminal by running backslash Q. Okay, so now we have created the spatial database and user for our application. So that's it for this video. I'll see you guys in the next one. Thank you. Hi guys, welcome back. In this lesson, we will be creating our project folder as well as creating a virtual environment for our application. So the first thing that we need to do is create a new folder for our project. So let's open up our desktop directory in our terminal. And now let's create our project folder. We will call it Ebesys Tutorials Okay, so inside our project folder, let's create our application folder. We will call it Water Watch. Okay, and now we are ready to create our virtual environment. We will be using a tool called virtual env. Virtual env will allow us to create a Python virtual environment for installing our third party libraries, which we will package with our application instead of installing them directly in the Ubuntu system. But first we need a tool called Python 3 pip, which is used to install Python third party libraries. So let's install Python 3 pip.
And now let's use pip to install virtual env. So let's run the following command. pip3 install virtual env. Okay, so virtual env has been installed successfully. So now the next thing that we need to do is create our virtual environment by running the following command, virtual env vnv. So vnv is the name of our virtual environment. It can be any name. In this lesson, we will call it vnv. Okay, so our virtual environment has been created. So now let us test and see if our virtual environment works. So to activate our virtual environment, we will run the following command, source vnv bin activate. Okay, so you will see the prefix is vnv. So this means that our virtual environment is active. So any Python third party libraries we install now will be installed only in our virtual environment, which is separate from our system so that we don't have any conflicting third party libraries. So now to deactivate it, we can just type deactivate. Okay, so that's it for this video. I'll see you guys in the next one. Thank you. Hi guys, welcome back. In this lesson, we will be installing and configuring GeoDjango. So the first thing that we need to do is we need to activate our virtual environment. Once our virtual environment has been activated, we need to make sure we are in our project folder. Okay, so now we are ready to install Django. So let's run the following command to install the Django framework. pip install Django. Okay, so now the next thing that we need to install is a library called PsychoPG2. So this library will allow us to connect to our PostgreSQL database from our Django application and will also allow us to read from and write to our PostgreSQL database. So that's it for this video. I'll see you guys in the next one. Thank you. Hi guys, welcome back. In this lesson, we will be installing our IDE. So the IDE that we will be using to write the code for our application is Visual Studio Code. So let's download the IDE and install it. Let's open up our web browser. Then we search for Visual Studio Code download. And then we select this link, code.visualstudio.com. Okay, and then we select the Debian file for Linux. And wait for it to finish downloading. Okay, so now let us install Visual Studio Code. Okay, and now let's verify that Visual Studio Code has been installed.
Okay, so as you can see, Visual Studio Code has been installed successfully. So that's it for this video. I'll see you guys in the next one. Thank you. Hi guys, welcome back. In this lesson, we will start to create our application. So we are just going to create a Django base application. So we make sure that we are in our project path. So let's run the following command to create our Django project. The name of the project will be water watch in small caps and then we add a space and a point. Okay, so now our Django base application should be created. Okay, so now the next thing that we need to do is create another folder called water watch app. So Django requires that we have the project folder as well as the app folder. So the app will contain all our model view controller files. So that's basically all the server side code that we will create for our application. Okay, so now let's create our app. So first make sure that we are in our project root directory. So we can use the manage.py file to create the app folder. So let's run the following command. Python manage.py start app water watch app. Okay, so now our app folder should be created. Let's verify that. Okay, so as you can see, we have our WaterWatch app folder created. So now let's have a look at the files inside. So now we have created a complete Django based project. So now we will start to write the application code for our project. So that will be it for this video. I'll see you guys in the next one. Thank you. Hi guys, welcome back. In this lesson, we will be testing our Django installation. We will do this by running the application. So the first thing that we need to do is change the permission of the project folder so that we can open it in Visual Studio Code. Okay, so let's deactivate our virtual environment and go back to our desktop directory. Okay, and now let us run the following command to change the permissions of the project folder. Okay, and now we have enabled full permissions on this folder. This is not a very secure approach, but because our focus is on learning GeoDjango, we won't worry about the details of the file permissions for this course. Okay, and now the next thing that we need to do is we need to open the project source code inside our IDE. So let's open up Visual Studio Code. Okay, and then select the Explorer button and then select Open Folder and then we locate our project source code. So here's our project folder and then click on Open Folder. Okay, so as you can see, our project has been opened in our IDE. So the next thing that we need to do is we need to install the Python extension. So we click on extensions and in the search type in Python. Okay, and then click on this extension. It says Python by Microsoft and then click on install. So we're just waiting for the extension to complete installing. Okay, so the extension has been installed. So let's close this and we can close this window as well. And let's go back to Explorer. Okay, so the next thing that we need to do is we need to open up our terminal from within Visual Studio. So we click on View 
and then select terminal. Okay, so it should automatically activate our virtual environment. If it doesn't, then we can just manually activate our virtual environment. Okay, so now the next thing that we are going to do is we are going to run our application server. So to do that, we will use the manage.py file. Okay, so here's the manage.py file in the project directory. So now let's run our server. Python manage.py run server. Okay, so as you can see, our server has started at port 8000 using the localhost IP. So usually I just hover over this IP and then click on follow link, or you can just copy and paste it in the web browser. So the quickest way is just to click on follow link. Okay, so now we should be able to see the Django page that tells us that the installation worked successfully. So now we know that our Django application is running successfully in this URL. Okay, so that's it for this video. I'll see you guys in the next one. Thank you. Hi guys, welcome back. In this lesson, we will update our settings.py code. We will also establish a connection to our spatial database that we have created previously in the Ubuntu shell. So we can close this window. And then we can terminate the server by pressing Ctrl C. Okay, so first we need to install a couple of third-party Python libraries that will allow us to manipulate geospatial data from within our application. So our virtual environment has been activated. So now we can install the libraries. So the first library that we need to install is Django Leaflet. Okay, so that was successfully installed. And the next library that we need to install is Django GeoJSON. So this will allow us to read and manipulate geospatial data in JSON format. Okay, and then the last library that we need to install for now is just GeoJSON. Okay, so now we have installed the Geo libraries that we need. So now the next thing that we need to do is we need to start modifying the source code. So we will start by modifying our settings.py code. So let's open the settings.py file. Okay, so the first thing that we are going to do is we are going to add the django.contrib.gis app inside the installed apps. So we will create another element called django.contrib.gis. Okay, and then we need to add our own app, which is called WaterWatch app. Okay, so now the next thing that we are going to do is we are going to modify the database connection string, which is over here. So this will define the connection string to allow us to connect to our spatial database. So first of all, the engine that we are using is PostGIS. So we're not using SQLite. Okay, this is the engine that we will use. And then the name is the name of the database that we will be using. And we said that the name of the database would be CPT Water. Okay, so we also need the username that we will need to connect to our database. And the user which we have created in the PostgreSQL shell was WaterWatch. And then we need to add the password for the user. And we said that the password was simply Postgres. So that's the same password that we use for every application. Okay, and then lastly, we need to specify the host. So the host is which IP the database is running on. And in our case, it's running on localhost. 
Okay, so now we've updated our settings.py code and now we can run the migrate statement so that the database connection will be created. Okay, so let's do that. So first we save the source code with control S. Now in our command line, we will run python manage.py migrate. Okay, so the connection to PostgreSQL has been established. So now we have established a connection to our PostgreSQL database from within Django. So that's it for this video. I'll see you guys in the next one. Thank you. Hi guys, welcome back. In this lesson, we will be creating the Django admin user. So Django has an administrative portal that allows us to connect to our database and then test and see if we can retrieve the data that has been stored in our database. So it's a good tool to use to test and see if you can make a connection to your database. So firstly, we need to create the user so that we can log into the admin console. So to do that, we are going to run the following command, python manage.py create super user. Okay, and the username will be the same username as the username for our database. So we want to keep the same username and password. So it's waterwatch. And then just press enter to skip the email and then enter the password. The password would just be Postgres. And then type it in again. Okay, so we can see the super user has been created successfully. So now let's test and see if we can log into the Django administration portal. So let's run the server. Okay, now let's open up the URL link where our server is running at. Okay, so now over here we are going to add a forward slash admin for the admin portal. So now let's type in our username that we have created and then the password we said was Postgres. Okay, so let's go to users to verify that our user has been created. So as you can see, we have created our user successfully, which is Waterwatch. Okay, so that's it for this video. I'll see you guys in the next one. Thank you. Hi guys, welcome back. In this lesson, we will create the model class of our application. So the model will be the table, which will store the data that we will be working with. And that is created in the models.py file. So if you haven't already, you can close the web browser and then terminate the server. Okay, and then the next thing that we need to do is click on models.py. Okay, so now we can add the source code. We'll start by commenting out the first import statement that we see here, because we are not using a standard Django model. We'll be using a GIS model. Okay, so we can do that. So we added this app in our settings.py file, django.contrib.gis, and now we are using its model. If we go back, you can see that we have added it as an app over here. So now we will be using it in our application. Okay, so now the next thing that we need to do is we need to create a model, and that is created over here. We can see create your models. So basically a model is just a class. So to create a model, we create it as a class and we give the class a name. We'll call it dam levels. So this will be the name of our table in our database. And then we give it a type, which is a model. So we are saying that this is a geospatial model. Okay, and the next thing that we are going to do is add the fields for our class.
So the first field that we will add is the ID field. And then we specify the data type for that field. So this is an integer type field. So you would say ID equals models dot integer field. And then we specify that this is a primary key. And then next we have a dam field, which will store the name of the dams. And this is of type char field. And then we give it a length of 100 characters. And the next field that we will add is the dam level value field, which we will call this week. So that will be the dam level value for this week. And this is of type decimal. And then we set its precision to a maximum of five digits. And we allow two decimal places. Okay, and the next field will be the same, but it will be the dam level value for last week. And it will have the same data type and precision. And then we do the same for the field that we call last year. So this will be the dam level value for last year. Okay, and the next field that we will add is the creation date field. So this will create a date for us when we insert a record into our table. And this will be of type date time. Okay, and then we add the geometry field. So this will be the field that will store all the GPS coordinates. So this will be our latitude and longitude values. And the data type for this field is a point type. So this type of field is only available in a GIS model. Okay, so basically this is creating the schema for our table in PostgreSQL. So these will be all our fields in the table. And this will be the data types. And this will be the name of the table. We'll call the table dam levels. Okay, and over here is where we add some metadata. So basically we're saying that each record in our table will be grouped by a dam. So the name of the dam will be unique and then each record will be identified by that dam name. And then if you click on the dam name, you will see all the information for that specific dam. And all of this is only necessary when using the Django admin portal. Otherwise it doesn't really matter in PostgreSQL. Okay, and then we're just giving an alias to our model this is how we want our model to appear in the Django admin portal. So we're just giving that the same name as the table name. So that's basically how you create a model in Django. And this model will be converted into a table in PostgreSQL. Okay, so we can save the code. And now the next thing that we need to do is run our migrations to make sure that our changes have been saved and that this table gets created in PostgreSQL. Okay, so we run python manage.py make migrations. Okay, so now you can see that the model has been created in PostgreSQL. So now we need to run migrate python manage.py migrate and this will actually save the settings and create the table in PostgreSQL. Okay, so the table has been successfully created for us in PostgreSQL. So in the next upcoming videos, we'll be testing this in the Django admin portal. So that's where we will test and see if all our data has been stored successfully. And if PostGIS and PostgreSQL have been integrated successfully as well. So that's it for this video. I'll see you guys in the next one. Thank you. Hi guys, welcome back. In this lesson, we will start to write the code that will scrape the data from a website. So the first thing that we are going to do is we are going to install three libraries. The first one is pandas. The second one is called beautiful soup four. And the third one is requests. So beautiful soup four is the library that we are going to use to do our scraping. And pandas is the library that we are going to use to do our ETL, which is to extract, transform and load the data into our spatial table. 
Requests is a library that we are going to use to do get requests on a given URL and return the HTML code for that web page. So let's start with pandas. So it's pip install pandas. Okay, so now that that is installed, the next library that we are going to install is Beautiful Soup 4. So it's pip install Beautiful Soup 4. And then we finally install the requests library. Okay, so once we have done that, we can close the terminal for now. Okay, and now let's open our settings.py file. And let's go to our list of installed apps. So we are going to add leaflet to our list of installed apps above the WaterWatch app. Okay, and then we can save the file. Once this is done, let's open our admin.py file. So now we are going to start writing the code that will scrape the data from the website. So let's start with our import statements. So the first one that we import is the point object. This will store all our latitude and longitude values. And then we import the daytime object in order to get the current date that we will use to insert the record into our table so that we can see the date and time in which the record was inserted. And then we import the leaflet geoadmin class. So in the admin.py file, you have to register your model as well as the admin class. And instead of importing a standard Django admin class, we will be using a leaflet geo admin class. And we have gotten that from the leaflet app that we have added over here. Okay, and then we import pandas. So we will use pandas to do our data transformations. And then we import the requests library, which is going to help us download the HTML code of our page when we enter the URL of the website that we will be scraping from. Okay, and then we import our model. So we need the model to be registered to the admin class. And lastly, we import beautiful soup, which is our scraping library. Okay, so once that is done, we are now going to register our model. So let's first create a geo admin class. Okay, so basically in order to register this admin class, we need to specify the name of the model over here as well as append the word admin. So this is what Django requires. And then we specify the type of admin class that we want to use. We want to use the leaflet geo admin class. So that's all we have to do. And now we need to register the model. So it's just admin.site.register. You pass in the model as well as the admin class for that model. Okay, so that's what we have to do before we can use the model.
Okay, so now the first thing that we are going to do is get the HTML page of the website that we are going to scrape from and store its HTML code in a page object. So we will be doing a get request on its URL. Okay, so we use the get function of the request library. So this will download our web page by using the URL. So I'll copy over the URL that we are going to use and that we are going to be scraping from. So it's going to get this page and store it in a page object. So now let's open up our web browser and go to this URL. Okay, and as you can see, here is the web page, and this is the data that we want to scrape. And now the next thing that we are going to do is we are going to look at the table over here and then take a look at its attributes. So now let's inspect the dam field. So we right click and then click on inspect. Okay, so here is the HTML code for this page. And as you can see, here is the dam field and it is part of the first row. So if we click on the drop down, we can see that each and every one of these tags are rows. And each row is stored inside the table body. So we want to scrape this table right here. And notice the properties of this table over here, especially the style. So we are going to use these attributes to pinpoint this exact table and allow us to scrape it. Because as you can see, there is another table. So if we just search for the table using beautiful soup, we wouldn't know which one to take. So as you can see, these attributes are different for this table. So we are going to use these attributes to uniquely identify this table that we are looking for. Okay, so if we click on one row, so this is one cell the first cell of the first row. And then if we click on the second cell, we can see it's the river field. And then the third one, photo and so on. So these are going to be the fields for our table. And we are going to use these cells to get our values. So we'll scrape each and every one. So now you have a bit of an idea of what we are looking for. And then we will perform ETL operations by removing some of the data that we don't want, like this total row over here. So we are going to transform this table into a table that we can use for our application. Okay, so now let's go back to our IDE. So once we've got the page, the next thing that we are going to do is create a beautiful soup object using that page. So we create a soup variable and then we create a beautiful soup object and then we pass in the page that we have gotten from this URL. So it's page.content and then we use the HTML parser of the beautiful soup object. You can also use an XML parser to pass XML but seeing that we have an HTML page we are going to use the HTML parser. Okay, and now the next thing that we are going to do is get the table container, which contains the damn data that we need. So we are going to use the find method of the beautiful soup object, which will allow us to search for the table that we want. So let's first create another variable. We are going to call it damn data container. And then it's equals soup.find. And then we are looking for a table element. And the table element also has attributes. It has an ID.
and it has an align center. So now we are going to test and see if it managed to get the correct table that we wanted by printing the container. So we are going to print the dam data container and then see what we get when we run the application. So let's open up our terminal. And then we can run the server with python manage.py run server. So we should be able to see the HTML code of the table printed in our terminal. So as you can see, the table has been found. So we have found the right table using the find method of the beautiful soup object. And this is the table that we are looking to scrape, table align center and the ID. And as you can see, we have the first row, which is all the fields. And we have the data that we need. So this is exactly what we are looking to scrape. Okay, so now we can comment out the print statement. So now we have our table. And now the next thing that we are going to do is first write an if statement to check if the table actually exists, because sometimes it disappears from the website and the application will crash if it can't find the table. So if it can't find the table, it will return a none. So we will do our scraping only if the table that we are looking for exists. Okay, so the next thing that we are going to do is get the rows of our table. So it's table rows equals damn data container dot find all tr. If we go back to the web page, it's going to find all of these rows. And then store it in this variable called table rows. So once we have done that, let's print table rows. Okay, so as you can see, we have isolated our table rows and it's stored in a list. So this is the opening bracket of the list. And then as you can see, this is the first element and below is the second element separated by a comma. And as you can see, each row has an opening and closing tag. So this is exactly what we want. And this is the end of the list. So now we have extracted the data that we need and we are ready to transform and clean the data. So that's it for this video. I'll see you guys in the next one. Thank you.